Morning, morning, morning. Let's turn to God's Word then, and we're going to continue in our journey through the book of Ephesians. We are reading Paul's letter to the Ephesians all the way through the autumn. This is talk number five. Uh, As always, if you miss any in the series or you want to hear a particular talk again, uh, you can always catch up on YouTube. You find YouTube uh, on your computer or on your app and search for St. Augustine's uh, Ipswich and you will find us and there's the channel and then just click on Ephesians. Uh, This morning we continue in chapter 2, picking up at verse 11. Uh, Turn there now in your Bible if you have one. If you have a pew Bible, one of the green Bibles, uh, that is uh, found on page 1174 this morning. 1174. Uh, What I'm going to do actually is read back a few verses this morning. I'm going to start at verse 8 to give us a bit more of a run into our passage this morning. If you've got chapter 2 in front of you, you will see at verse 11 uh, one of Paul's therefores. Uh, That's the word that starts verse 11 which reminds us we're jumping into a train of thought. We're jumping into an argument that's already underway. Paul didn't, unfortunately, write 13 different letters so that we could give 13 different talks. That would have made our life easier, but he didn't do that. He wrote one letter, one unified, coherent piece of teaching. We have to do our best, as far as we possibly can, to stay mindful of that as we study and we listen to any particular part of it. I hope you found time, incidentally, uh, or you're thinking of finding time, to read the whole of the letter to the Ephesians soon, as it was intended to be read, or rather, as it was intended to be heard. Uh, For most of us, that's like 25 minutes, uh, even if we're taking our time about it, and it will give us a bird's eye view, a kind of a a uh, 30,000 degree, uh, no, foot uh, view, uh, not degree, that would be very hot, uh, 30,000 foot view uh, of, of what Paul is trying to communicate in this letter, reinforcing uh, what we're learning week by week on Sundays, no doubt showing you lots of other uh, wonderful things too. It's going to encourage you, lift you up, cause you to love Jesus more. For this morning though, let's just rewind these uh, verses, three verses, let's go back to verse 8 and begin our scripture reading there. Here we go. Ephesians 2, uh, starting at verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Here we go, verse 11 now. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenant of promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near for through him we both have access to the father by one spirit consequently you are no longer foreigners and strangers but fellow citizens with God's people And also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Amen. I'm so glad that I get to preach this passage this morning. It's a passage which has given my life new meaning in the past. 
And it's a passage which continues to give my life meaning today. This is a passage about what I think is God's best idea. After Ephesians 1, setting out the glorious mystery, the revelation of Jesus Christ, and then half of chapter 2, laying out for us what that means, spelling out for us that it means that we are made alive in Christ even when we were as good as dead in our sins, now Paul gets to the consequences, to the effects, to the end result of what God has done in and through Jesus, what he was going for all along. And what that is, in a word, is the creation of a community. This was always God's idea. Dallas Willard writes this, The aim of God in human history is the creation of an all-inclusive community of loving persons with himself included in that community as its prime sustainer and most glorious inhabitants. The name we give to this community is the church. But that is a difficult word. In some ways, it would be easier if we didn't have to use that word, church. Because it's a word that we struggle to hear properly anymore. For some of us, that word church is completely, inextricably, inescapably bound up with the idea of a building. A bricks and mortar place. We go to church. We perhaps visit a church. The word has lost all of its power. For others of us, so much of our life have been shaped by the weekly activities, the rhythms of worship, the hymns, the liturgy, the traditions of church. We're so used to understanding ourselves as part of the church It's as meaningful to us as if we were to say, I'm from England, or I am from Suffolk. It's just an identity marker. Again, it's lost all of its power. For still others of us, if we're honest, we're here despite the church. Things have been said and done to us in the name of the church, which are not good. And we are holding on for dear life to our faith in the Lord Jesus, despite the fact he talks about this thing called church and it's got something to do with him. But we don't really trust the idea of the church, and we certainly get nervous about being asked to be part in any meaningful way of a church. Let's just be honest. Well, it's almost as if the Apostle Paul saw this coming. Because fascinatingly, in this section of his letter, in fact, in the whole of chapter 2 of Ephesians, Paul never once uses the word church. He describes the church, he defines the church, but he never once uses the word. And maybe there's something in that. So I'm going to try to refer this morning not to the word church, but to a different phrase. And the phrase is gospel community. Gospel community. Gospel and community are two words which are utterly tied together in Paul's mind. And they should be in ours too. And I'll try and explain what I mean as we go along this morning. Let's take a look at our reading piece by piece. If we've got the reading in front of us, I want you to see that there are three sections to Paul's teaching here. Three clear sections. Verses 11 and 12, starting at that uh, word therefore where we started. 11 and 12 speak of our alienation from Christ. Verses 13 through to 17 then go on to speak about reconciliation in Christ. And finally, verses 18 to 22 talk about our destination in Christ. 
alienation, reconciliation, our destination. Let's talk about what I think is God's best idea. Gospel community through each of these three stages. Firstly, the problem, alienation. Alienation is a terrible thing. That sense of of not belonging, that sense of being on the outside looking in rather than being inside with the in crowd. Alienation is traumatizing for a child being left out. It's traumatizing for a young person being left out of a social group. And even though we may not encounter it in quite the same way, it can be traumatizing for adults too. It's playing out in fierce and unpleasant ways in our world at the moment. If you think about cancel culture and the way that works, to cast out an individual, to cancel them as if they no longer exist because their views are hostile to ours. Or the trend of deplatforming in universities and colleges where some people are judged to be beyond the pale of what's acceptable because of their views and are therefore no longer invited to be part of the conversation. Alienation from a, a health perspective. Feelings of alienation are an important indicator of mental ill health. That sense of being disconnected from others and a stable community are all linked to depression and anxiety, psychological distress, not to mention alcohol use disorders, insomnia, PTSD, and increased risk of suicide. Alienation is a word that appears alongside all of those things. The caring and healing professions know this well, and God knows this well. God knows our deep need, our deep emotional and psychological need for connection to a stable community and not to be alienated. We sometimes call this sense of belonging and uh, being part of something communion. Isn't that interesting? The author of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul, is writing to a community where Some of its people knew very well what it meant to be in the in crowd. And some of its people knew very well what it meant to be on the outside looking in. Which is why he talks at the start about Gentiles by birth. There was a time not so long before this letter was written when the vast majority of the world was excluded from a relationship with God. Starting way back with Abraham, God had chosen a people, a particular people on the face of the earth, the Hebrew people, the people from which Jesus came. And to them, it seemed like they were the only ones God cared about. They were the ones who'd had the revelation of God. They're the ones who'd received the law. They were the ones to whom the prophets were sent. They were God's special people. It was visibly shown in the temple courts in Jerusalem, where people came to worship. The temple was designed with courts within courts, different layers of access, and there was a point, a very clear point, at which only Jewish people, only Hebrew people could go any further. There was a thick dividing wall keeping everybody who didn't belong out. There were signs placed in Latin and Greek just to make sure if you were a Gentile, you knew you were not allowed past this place. And if you did, it could be punishable by death. But then Jesus appeared and suddenly all bets were off. Jesus showed us that God had bigger plans all along. That that promise that he made to Abraham would, was always meant to be about the blessing of everybody on the face of the earth, not just one particular people. Remember what Dallas Willard said again? The aim of God in all of human history is the creation of an all-inclusive community of loving persons with himself included in that community as its prime sustainer and most glorious inhabitant. God's answer to the problem that he knew we had 
of alienation. Alienation from him and alienation from one another, right, is found right here in verses 13 and 14. But now, in Christ Jesus, he's the one who's done it, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. That's what he's thinking of when he's writing this, that wall in the temple, that dividing wall that said, so far and no further for you. God's answer to the problem of alienation is reconciliation. And it's not accomplished by good arguments. It's not accomplished by law. It's not accomplished by goodwill even. It is accomplished only through Jesus Christ. Some people's greatest objection to the idea of a loving God is the reality of war and conflict in our world. If there was a God, they say, why would he allow this? Why would he allow wars? Which is a totally understandable point of view. How can we speak about peace? How can I speak about reconciliation without naming the reality of war this morning? It would be completely wrong to do that. I looked up the numbers this week. The official UN figure, and it could be more, for those who've been killed in the current Israel-Hamas conflict, stands at 43,000 people. It's going to be exponentially more than that by the end, probably. I heard this week that casualty and death toll of the Russian-Ukraine war, which has been going on now for a year and a half, has exceeded a million people. It would not be acceptable for me to preach about peace and not mention these horrific figures. And this is the mental barrier so many people have to the idea of a loving God. Why doesn't he intervene? The answer is to say, clearly, he has intervened. He has intervened in the most costly way possible in sending his own son, Jesus Christ, not only to teach us how to live peaceably, not only to show us how to live peaceably, but to die in order to bring peace. Peace between us and God and peace between one another. For he himself, Paul says, is our peace. T.J. Timms calls these words maybe the six best words in the Bible. For he himself is our peace. Praise God. The message of the gospel is that we are powerless within ourselves to make peace. With God or with one another. But in Jesus Christ, by his power, these things are possible. In fact, scripture teaches us these things are inevitable. Once this world is made new and it's already starting to be made new, did you notice how he talks about us as a new humanity? There is a new creation breaking out, being birthed among us. The nature of this new creation is total peace. Isaiah prophesied a day, nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Leslie, this morning in her prayers, even without knowing what I was going to be preaching about, preached, uh, spoke from, from that exact passage, that nations will turn their swords into plowshares. Neither shall they learn war anymore. The word the Bible uses for this, reconciliation. God's answer to the eternal human problem of alienation is reconciliation in Jesus through the cross. And that's the gospel. That's the essence of the gospel. Verse 17, he came and preached peace. Whenever we preach the gospel, we are preaching peace. Peace between God and human beings. Peace between human beings and human beings. That's the definition of reconciliation. And it's not meant to stop with us. The fulfillment of that promise that God made to Abraham, that he would be blessed in order to be a blessing, that he would have a family, a nation that would be a blessing to the rest, of, is in order to bless the rest of the world. We've been blessed to be a blessing. We have been reconciled in order to reconcile, you see? We have been included in order that we would be those who include we have been rescued in order that we would be part of God's movement to the world of rescue. 
we have been enlightened, illuminated for the purpose of being a light to the nations. And so we get to this idea of gospel community. A community of people who have been shaped by that gospel of peace. And a gospel of peace, which is shared by a community of people. That's why I call this the the destination, the consequence. This is the result of what Christ has done. And the final section of our passage, verses 18 onwards, give us three images as to what that looks like. What does a gospel community look like? He tells us now that we have, verse 18, access to the Father. Three pictures, one after another, three successive pictures showing three successive degrees of closeness to God. Let's look at them one by one. Firstly, verse 19. Paul says this. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens. Citizens. Citizens are individuals, different individuals from different backgrounds, different histories, different life stories, different contexts. But as citizens, we are all equally valuable in the eyes of the law. Citizens have rights and citizens have responsibilities to one another, which begins to tell us something about what it means to be a gospel community. But that's just the first picture. Here's the second. You are fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. The second picture Paul gives is closer. We are members of a household. We are members of a family. That picture on the screen right now is a picture we took yesterday when I got together with my family, all of my sides, my brothers and sister our our partners and children and my mum and dad, all in that picture. Beautiful picture. And it reminds me that a family is joined by more than rights and responsibilities. A family is joined by blood. We're related by blood. We're related by shared ancestry. We're related by shared history. And a family, although it's not true of us, we're spread out all over the country, but a family is much more proximate, much closer together as a general rule. A family operates not on the rules of citizenship, of law, but on the law of love. It's closer, it's more intimate. That's starting to get towards what Paul means by a gospel community. But there's one more picture that God uses for the gospel community. Verse 21 says this, We are a holy temple in the Lord, being built together to become a dwelling place for God. And my third picture is this one. It's the picture from our October newsletter, and it shows us as a church family on mission. This is the picture taken last month from our Living Hope mission. What is a gospel community? What is a church? There's the C word. It's all of these three things. It's a place where everybody is equal. Before God, everybody has responsibilities to the community and everyone can expect to be treated with respect. But more than that, much more than that, a gospel community is a family that should be built together, should have tenderness, should have kindness, should have gentleness and affection, should be love between us. More than that, though, it's a family that should be built so close together and so close to Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, that it becomes a dwelling place for God himself. Sit with that for a second. Church isn't about my rights and responsibilities. Church is about family. And a certain kind of family that is built so closely together that we become a dwelling place for God himself. Those words from Dallas Willard again. The aim of God in human history is the creation of an all-inclusive community of loving persons with himself included in that community 
as its prime sustainer and most glorious inhabitant. And notice in all of this, the one doing the work, the one doing the action, the subject of all the verbs, the instigator and the initiator of this gospel community is not us, but the Lord God himself. There are nine verbs in this opening passage, and they're all things that God has done. None of them are things that we do. Maybe the reason many of us are wary of belonging to a church, of being part of a church community, is because it feels like it's all activity. It's all doing, doing, doing. What Paul teaches here is that church is something that has already been done. He's done it. It's something which God has done in Jesus Christ. Later on in his letter, Paul is going to get to all kinds of things about behavior and standards and expectations for how we might live together as a gospel community. But right here, gospel community is first and foremost God's work. The gospel of reconciliation forms a community which is given to the world as a demonstration of God's power to reconcile us to himself. I want to make a really practical application to finish this morning, because if we're not careful, we could end up just staying up here in the theory zone. And I believe there is a real practical and quite challenging application for us this morning. But we're not afraid to hear a challenging application, are we? No. I want to say this, that if you're part of this gospel community, I need you and we need you to be a full part of this gospel community. If you're not part of this gospel community, you're just visiting us today, this isn't for you. But if this is your gospel community, if this is your church, I need you and we need you to play a full part in our gospel community. Tim Keller, great Bible teacher, tells a story about C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis we know from, from the Narnia books. He was called Jack... Uh, by his friends. And he was one of three friends who considered themselves co-best friends. Co-best friends. The three of them were, there were not, there was not one of them that was a better friend than the others. They were all equally best friends. Do you see what I mean? And so it was tragic when one day, one of them, Charles, died. Jack, as he was thinking about this, as grieved as he was, said, well, I've got Ronald. He was the third of the friends. And if anything, now Charles has gone, we'll be, we'll be closer than we were before. If anything, now that Charles is gone, I'll have more of Ronald than I had before. But as the weeks and the months went by after Charles sadly died, Jack found that his intuition was wrong. He actually didn't have more of Ronald. He actually felt like he had less. Because there was a side of Ronald that Charles brought out that Jack couldn't. You see? So it was lost forever. Lewis began to understand it takes a community to really know a person. People are too complex. They're too deep. There are too many sides to each of us, to be fully known by only one person. It's only as we see one another relating to other people in the community that we actually see all of the beauty, all of the wonder, all of the complexity that another person brings to our lives. It takes a community to draw out the whole person. And what Lewis came to realize is, well, if that's true of another human being, how much more true would that be of the Lord Jesus? You cannot know Jesus by yourself. All you'll see of him is the one tiny bit of him that you see. We need gospel community to see Jesus as he really is. We need to see the Lord Jesus reflected in the lives and the stories and the struggles and the celebrations of one another in order to see Jesus. That's why we encourage each other, not just to attend church, not just to come to church, but to belong in other ways. 
by far the best way to belong to this community, this, this church, St. Augustine's, is to belong to a grow group, a deeper community where we can know and be known by others as we read scripture together, as we pray together and do life together. But there are others. There are our communities like TLC on a Wednesday. There are our regular prayer meetings, three a week, and we'd love there to be more. There are ways of serving, serving with our children and our young people that put us in a community and help us to see more of Jesus. I need Jesus. And thank God he has chosen to give himself to me. But here's the bizarre thing. Here's the counterintuitive thing. Here's the thing that makes me realize his wisdom is greater than my wisdom. He has chosen to give himself to me through you. He's chosen to give himself to me. His love, his kindness, his compassion, his multicolored wisdom, his conviction and challenge at times, his encouragement and his strengthening much more often through you. It's you, Ros. It's you, Brian. It's you, Sarah. It's you, Lou. It's you, Karen. That's just the front two rows. I have his word. I have prayer. I have the sacraments. And I have you. And we have each other. Let me just finally spell out the implications for us then. If you were to decide not to fully play your part in a gospel community, if you decide not to truly belong to a gospel community, but to stay out on the edges, if you decide to take a break from gospel community, perhaps life gets a little less certain, perhaps your job's less certain, perhaps you're not sure what's going to happen with with an illness, with your family. And rather than leaning in to gospel community, you pull away. And we don't see you for a period of time. Perhaps, and let's say it out loud, because I know it happens, you have a falling out with someone. And it becomes awkward to come to church. Because you don't want to bump into that person. So you pull back for a few weeks. The answer to that problem, by the way, the answer to that problem of alienation, that separation, is exactly the same for you as it is spelt out in Ephesians. It's reconciliation through the cross of Jesus. If you make the choice to stay on the edge of gospel community, I can say with certainty that you will miss out on encountering Jesus in all his beauty and all of his wisdom. But I want you to hear this morning is this, is that we will miss out too. I often notice if I take a weekend off, as I did last weekend, or two or three weekends off, if we go away with the family, for example, I often spend the next couple of weeks answering the same question. Where did you go? Did you have a nice time? What did you do? I smile about it. Because you missed me. (laughs) It's a lovely thing to be missed. But what you might be considerably less aware of is this. If when you don't show up to grow group, or when you don't show up on a Sunday or to a regular prayer meeting, we miss you too. Your voice was missing. Your contribution was missing. We saw less of Jesus that day because you weren't there and I don't say that to guilt you or shame you honestly but perhaps the Holy Spirit would want to convict us all this morning about what can easily become a very casual approach to gathering as his people we shouldn't be casual about that the writer to the Hebrews spelt this out for us he said let us not give up the habit of meeting together as some are in the habit of doing instead let us encourage one another all the more, he says that. There is something powerful, irreplaceably powerful about gospel community. People of God coming together to pour out the praises of God in the presence of God, living out gospel community. I wonder what the cost is to the gospel of Jesus Christ flourishing in our nation because of the very modern tendency to come to church once or twice a month. Because there's so many other things to do. 
God's best idea is gospel community. The gospel of Jesus lived out in community. A community of people in which to belong and which becomes the very dwelling place of God. Amen.